So, as I talked about in the first part of the series, if you haven't watched it, I urge you to 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 watch the first part. This is the second part series of the of the series. And I discussed about the verses relating to the man clove with the inkhorn and how this is all interrelated with the four pillars. Now, we see how when we look at it just to to rehash and touch upon it, in Ezekiel chapter 9, 2 through 7, it talks about the man clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. Now, it's very important, you know, because following him comes the men who have slaughter weapons in their hand who slays the people. Now, all of this is obviously, you know, I'm touching more upon the spiritual symbolism of it. And then also, it, you know, of course, as we know, there are two realities. And obviously, when you could break the scripture down, you know, some people say four principles or there's four dimensions that, you know, I often like to touch upon, you know, you have the physical, the spiritual, the the social, you know, as far as, you know, how everything correlates on a global scale and then on the personal scale within. Now, to touch upon the spiritual symbolism that we can find in this chapter regarding the man clove with the inkhorn is how he is making note of the people who do not wish to follow the lifestyle of the wicked. And this is very important because as you know, in this day and age, even as the quote of his imperial majesty says, there's a lot of deception going on. This generation is being bombarded on every side, every possible angle with different wicked agendas, entertainment, lifestyle, uh, violence within the community, just not following the way of the Most High. Now, this is, like I said, this is very important. And I also touched upon how, like, I'm going to just read these two verses. It says, in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3, And the glory of Elohim of Israel was going up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with the lint, with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And Yah said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem, also known as Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And I'm also going to read, continue reading down further. So it says, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth, and they went forth and slew in the city. This is all connected. So we see, and when I say connected, we see that this man that is clothed with linen, that is marking people upon their foreheads, this is the same terminology that's also used in Revelations. In chapter 7, verse 3, it says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the seed, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of the Most High Yah in their foreheads. Now, again, there's a marking being done upon the foreheads to seal the people that are fed up and done with living the lifestyle of Babylon. It's sickening. Yet you can talk to some people and tell them about it, and they don't want to hear it. To them, it's just, well, it is what it is. Well, no, it's not it, not. it. It's not what it is. It's not the way that we need to carry out living our lives, or else we're going to fall into utter destruction. This is why those people are being marked so that they can be set apart. Like it says, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So the men and women, because, you know, you know, human beings. So all humanity, all the people that are fed up living according to the Babylon, Babylonian lifestyle and are seeking a way out, they're being marked. And the Mosai is calling them. And as we know, the Mosai says, it said, well, it said in the, in the word, in the scriptures, that many are called, few were chosen. So you have these pe the people that are the right people that are going to hear the call, that are going to hear the voice of the trumpet that's speaking. And sometimes this voice may be a subtle voice. It's not, it may not always be a big uh, beaming light that's going to shine upon you and say, 
it's time for you to get up and go. It may be a more subtle voice. It could be even like this video that is just a message of blowing the trumpet, the utterance, saying it's time to go. It's time to start to get your things, get your things and leave. Just like it was in the days of Saddam and Gomorrah, how Lot was grabbed, taken by his arm and pulled out so that he wouldn't be destroyed. So that when, when Saddam and Gomorrah was destroyed, he was taken out. He had to leave the land. So too with this place, which in Babylon, Babylon obviously is global. It's time for us to come out. So he's marking those people upon their foreheads. And why? It's very important that you pay attention to what it also says. Following this man. Marking them upon their foreheads, we have other men that carry slaughter weapons that follow. As it says in verse 2, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Now, following this man going around and marking them, comes the men that have the slaughter weapons, which go out to slay all the people who do not have the mark. So we see in Revelations 9, 4, it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of the Most High in their foreheads. So we see that the people that do not have the seal, they are getting punished, just like in Ezekiel 9. Even though it's a different error, and, you know, at that time, the judgment was happening upon Israel. We still see the circ the similar circumstances, similar divine judgment happening, whereby the people that are that obey the most high, the people that are done with the Babylonian lifestyle, they're being protected. They have divine protection, whereas the people that don't, the people that like it talks about right here, when we see Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 10, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of the Most High Yah, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. So we see these people are getting punished. We see in, like it says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So all throughout we see that the people who have the mark of the beast are getting tormented, they're getting punished, they're going through things. But, as we know, it says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. It's important that you realize, you know, for the people saying that, Oh, I'm protected, I'm saved. It's directly giving you a warning. It's telling you to come out. The people that, like I said, are listening to the subtle voice, that are tired of the circumstances, and not just people that are sick and tired of living in Babylon, but yet they continue to go about living in Babylon. But to the people that are sick and tired of Babylon and want to leave. That's because, like it says right here, if you're going out and you're talking about how evil and corrupt Babylon is, you see the wickedness that's going on around you. But you continue to live in the land. What do you think is going to happen to you? Well, there's a very possibility, real possibility. I'm not saying every Israelite that's still in Babylon is going to be killed. Because as we know, there will be a second wave. But there is a possibility that you can end up passing away. You can end up being, end up dying. Because as it says right here, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plates. Judgment is coming. But again, as it talks about in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of the Most High. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of the Most High? Now, and when we look at Ezekiel 9, it says in verse 6, Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 6, Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So it's telling you where does the where does the judgment and of the most high begin? At the sanctuary. Right now, who are the people that are going through the most tribulations? Obviously the Israelites. And of course you got other races or other groups and ethnicities that are going through issues and problems. But what I'm saying is as a people globally, the ones who are 
majority the majority of us are going through tribulations. We don't have a land. We are many of us are living in the land of captivity. So when it's talking about the judgment where it's beginning, it's beginning at us. It starts at us. Right now we're coming out of the Deuteronomy 28 curses. But as long as we continue to live in the land, we're still going to suffer through the plagues. We're still going to suffer through the police brutality because what do you think? They're going to be like, oh, well, the 400 years are up. Let's treat them like kings and priests. No, it's not going to happen like that. The only thing these people recognize is power. It's only through once the war is completely over and they're officially defeated will that change come about. But prior to that, nah, you're still going to be going through police brutality. You're still going to be going through mass incarceration, discrimination, and a bunch of other things. And obviously, some some of our people have a very comfortable lifestyle, haven't had to face racism or discrimination. And that's a blessing. But they use that as a way of being shielded to say, I'm fine where I'm at. And trust me, the gauntlet is coming down because when Babylon falls, you're going to feel it, too. So it's important that if you were fortunate enough to build a wealth here, you realize, OK, the time is near. It's time for me to come out of the land and don't be coming out with no Babylonian mentality. Abandon that Babylonian mentality and move to Africa and use that wealth to build. Now, like I said, all of this is obviously connected. Now, to highlight the part of the church, because like it says, through the midst of Jerusalem, Jerusalem also represents the church. Like I said, there are different principles or ways that we could break down the scripture. Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, but also on another symbolic level, it represents the church. Now, to connect this to the pillar, which is one of the pillars, which is the church of Hail Selassie I the first. So we talked about how it's important that we realize that, you know, the circumstance, a lot of the circumstances are similar. The way the the, the judgment obviously is being carried out, it's not 100 percent the exact same way, because obviously, you know, we're living in a different era. We're living in a different land. But now we see that this judgment is going to pass away from off of us and it's going to come upon the Gentiles is going to go upon the nations who did the oppressing. And this is written in Genesis 15. It says, and he said unto Abraham, and this is the most high speaking to Abraham or Abraham, which you will later become known as know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Now, we saw, as I talked about with the transatlantic slave trade, bur uh, blackbirding, whereby you had Israelites that were scattered throughout different parts of Asia that were being forced into indentured servitude and slavery. You also had the Arab slave trade. We had Israelites that were being mistreated, put into subjugation by different nations of the earth, whether it's the Arabic nations, whether it's the, or um, well, the Islamic Arabic nations, the European nations, America, Asia, you name it. All these nations, even these nations, even in Africa, they're all going to be judged. So that's why it's important for us to go to the Holy Land, to gather together. Now, you know, I touched on those different aspects of it, of how the judgment is going to come upon the house of Yah. Now, where do we start to correlate this? So to take highlight this verse and then this verse right here where it talks about Jerusalem. So now to look at the church dynamic and how where does the, the church as the one of the four pillars comes into play and why it's important. So as it says in 1 Peter 4 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of Yah. Now the house of Yah, that's the church, that's the temple. You know, one of the four pillars. Now it goes to show that it says the fact that it says judgment must begin at the house of Yah, that obviously there are bad actors within the church, within the temple, that are trying to lead it astray, trying to cause rifts and, and schisms within. But 
it says it talks about as it talks about when Peter four seventeen, the most high he's going to judge and purge the church of these bad actors, of anyone that's trying to cause a breach. Why this is important? Well, this correlates because as I talked about regarding Jerusalem, when we look at the symbology the the, the, the symbology of Jerusalem and how it correlates to the church is that for instance, let's take a look, because obviously in order to discover this hidden meaning, we're going to have to look at, read between the lines in order to find the esoteric meaning. So we could start at, in 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 1, it says, Then King Solomon assembled the elders of Israel. Now we know he's, he's King Solomon, so that's why I just said king, even though it doesn't mention it, but we'll see it. So then King Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yah out of the city of David, which is Zion. Now, Zion and the Ark of the Covenant are synonymous. So, you know, as I talked about in my previous videos, we know that the Ark of the Covenant will later be moved into Ethiopia. But if we're still looking at it from you know, obviously the reconciliation, technically Israel and Ethiopia are also in a way synonymous in that Ethiopia will later, as its borders extended, would later, um, Ethi Israel will later become assimilated into the Ethiopian empire. Now, when we see it says in Jerusalem, so the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem. So, why? Because Solomon was building a temple. And this is actually talked about, you know, you could do research on, it's often known as Solomon's Temple, King Solomon's Temple, also known as the first temple that he built as a placer, as it says, Solomon as a placer of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, a windowless inner sanctum within the structure. So he built this uh he constructed this temple had it built and the ark of the covenant was placed inside of the temple and this temple being inside of jerusalem now we see also when we look at the scriptures how during the first church jerusalem was the first center of the church according to the book of acts we can see this as it talks about in so if we look at Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So now, you know, this church, obviously, was the Christian church, because Saul at that time was persecuting Christians. So we see that, you know, the church, the first Christian church, was established in Jerusalem. So we see this connection of the church, whether it be, you know, the temple, you know, which also known as Temple Church, was established in Jerusalem, starting with King Solomon. And then we also see the establishment of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Solomon starting it in Jerusalem, the Christian church in Jerusalem. We also see it in Revelations, when we look at Revelations chapter 21, it talks about how, if we scroll down, verse 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will shew thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Yah. Now, as we just read in Revelations 20, which I talked about in the previous video, it says right here, and it says in the ninth verse, Revelations chapter 20, verse 9, And they went up on the breath of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from Yah out of heaven, and devoured them. So what is the city? As it says right here in Revelations 21 and shewed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from yah now we see that so the city is jerusalem now if we scroll down also we see in revelations chapter 
21, verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple therein, for Yah, our Elohim, Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple of it. So, again, we see how, you know, on the physical level, we see the brick and mortar church being in Jerusalem. And then on the spiritual level, we see the new, the, the holy city Jerusalem coming down from heaven with Yah, our Elohim, and the Lamb being the temple of it. So once again, you have the temple in Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem is the church. But as we see within the temple, the temple being in the holy city of Jerusalem, we see the same thing being done on the physical level. You know, through with the Christian church, with the first temple. So, when we look at Zechariah, because again, you know, to, to, to correlate everything. Let's see, Zechariah. So, if we look at Zechariah chapter 12 and scroll down, it talks about in verse 7, Yah also shall say the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. So who is then the inhabitants of Jerusalem? As I said, the inhabitants of Jerusalem is the church, because as we know, the temple is always within Jerusalem, within that holy city. So the church, the inhabitants of Jerusalem is the church. And as I talked about previously, the house of David, that's the crown council of Ethiopia, because as it says that when we talked about how the Lord would establish the house of David, what we see in 1955, the revised constitution, and as it talks about in Genesis, let's see where that part is at. In Genesis chapter 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Shiloh, who is Shiloh? Shiloh is obviously referring to his imperial majesty. Because as it talks about in Article 2, the imperial dignity shall remain perpetually attached to the line of Hail Selassie, descendant of King Sali Selassie, whose line descends without interruption from the dynasty of Menelik I, son of the Queen of Ethiopia, the Queen of Sheba, and King Solomon of Jerusalem. So again, we see the Jerusalem aspect. He establishes, as it says, the Most High will establish her himself. He establishes the house of David through the line of Hail Selassie I, the first, just as it was established through the line of King Solomon. We see it now established through the line of Hail Selassie I, the first, who was a descendant of King Solomon. And by being a descendant of King Solomon, descends from the royal line of David. So his line, his lineage, represents the house of David as it talks about in Zechariah 12. So when people start talking about, as I said before in the previous video, about uh, we don't need no more kings and we don't need... No, BS, it doesn't... Where, where does it say we don't need no more kings? Where does it say we don't need the house of David no more? Show me that. What is that? Um, where people say, oh, well, you know, the king line is all done and over with. Show me where the king line is done and over with. There's not. You won't be able to find it. Now, all of these things, obviously, like I said, has a purpose. So if we scroll down, when I go to where it says in the seventh, well, before going there, as it says right here, it's a purpose that this has to happen, obviously, because there are so many personalities and egos within the, and within the church and even within the Crown Council of Ethiopia. We have to understand, at the end of the day, we're still man. We're not perfect. Man and woman, we're not perfect. We still make mistakes. We still sin. Ego comes in, personalities, and just wickedness. So when it talks about, you know, why is the Most High saving the tents of Judah first? Why? Because when you look at tents, what is really tent? A tent, it, it means you really have no power, mainly. You have no land, You it, and you don't have really... a a lot of power or wealth. Obviously, when all of Judah starts coming together, then we become a very powerful people. But as we are just being tents, you know, a tent can, you know, if a strong wind comes, 
it'll knock a tent down. It's not like a, a brick house. Compared to, like it says, the glory of the house of David, the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, these things are, you know, they have more influence. They're institutions that have been established for years. So that's why the Most High says he will save the tents of Judah first, understanding that even within the house of David and within the church, there is ego, there is nepotism, there is other factors and things of that nature that feel like, you know, why should we have to all sit down at the table as equals? And I'm not saying everyone feels that way, but, you know, there are some that feel like they have this superiority mindset that, you know, not, nah, you know, and it's the most high setting everything up to happen in a manner that is righteous. So as it says, he will save us first because it's important that we all come to the table together and sit down and break bread. We all have to get to that point to list out the grievances, what needs to be addressed and move forward with solutions. And this comes to why the tents of Judah are saved first. And it also brings us down to uh, if we also scroll down to where it says in the 10th verse, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Why? Because like it even talks about in 1 Peter that we had just read, let's see. That judgment first begins at the house of the Mosai. So we see the house of David. We see the house of David. We see the church of the Mosai, the temple. So we see where the judgment is starting because, like it says, the spirit of grace and of supplication that's causing you to realize the error of your ways is causing you to purge yourself and cleanse yourself of all sins, ego, and vanity. All the wickedness that has come upon you, even the wicked actors and the bad actors that are sowing seeds of dissent and bre trying to create breaches within the house of David, within the crown council of Ethiopia being the house of David, and within the church of El Selassie the I being the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And causing you to realize, okay, you know, let's get our minds right. Let's see where, what direction have we been moving in? Let's slow down and take a look and, and really analyze what our goals need to be. What are our aims, objectives? What's the mission? Let's go back to our first love, which is the Most High. Because clearly, as it says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, meaning they have sinned against the Most High. It wouldn't say they shall look upon me whom they pierced if they didn't do no wrong. So why are people, everybody will go, oh, well, they're going to go all the way back to Yeshua Hamashiach, but they don't want to go not even back, what, 30 years to his imperial majesty? Think about it. Why is it saying the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem? What, is it talking about the Pharisees that are already long dead and gone? Or is it talking about something recent? Because the lamb, Yeshua Hamashiach, is inside of his imperial majesty why because we are all part of the body of christ so the lamb is also within his imperial majesty how can you say he's not that's the christ consciousness and it's prophesied that the christ would sit on david's throne according to acts 2 29 through 30 so now when we look at this angle how is this all connected well we see that the church the church needs to go through this period of mourning and supplication. The Crown Council of Ethiopia needs to go through this period of mourning. Why? Because let's look at, look at what, what the page says. And this is the official Crown Council. It says, It is significant to note that the monarchy has not relinquished its roles and duties in Ethiopia. Since 2004, the Crown Council has redefined the role that a, cons that a constitutional monarchy can play in Ethiopia that is much more in line with the role that constitutional monarchy plays in other countries. What is this? Why are we following after the rest of the world, which is Babylon? Why are we trying to be like the English Crown 
why are we trying to be like, I, I don't know, all the other crowns, but the goal should not be like this. The goal is to realize that you are the house of David. You even say it when you talk about the Imperial Solomonic Dynasty, which is mentioned even on the page. Let's see. So we see right here on the official page under the biography of His Imperial Majesty, Hel Selassie the First. it says right here, Ross McConan, and therefore lives to fire McConan, were directly of the Solomonic line. Now, Tafari Makona, upon his coronation, is given the name Hail Selassie I, the first. So this whole crown, like we said, it goes back to the 1955, the lawgiver, um, and even, I believe, prior to that, in the 1931 Constitution, and subsequently, you know, during deliberations in the government with the legislative chamber and, you know, all of those things that were going on, you know, they set up the crown council. So all these things His Imperial Majesty put into place. Now. When we look at the Solomonic line, as we saw, see, this is a line set apart. This is the line that the Most High chooses, the House of David, the everlasting covenant he sets up, not with any other king, but with the House of David. So the Solomonic line also, you know, can be stated as being the House of David. But because obviously Solomon is the son of King David. So. Why are you trying to be like all the other nations? We are supposed to be set up as the ensign for all nations to look to us. Why are we looking at what other nations are doing and trying to become, well, let's follow the way their crown has become. So this is why I said the, the, the period of mourning has to come upon the crown council. Not only that, but even if we look into other parts, let's see. background we see emperor hel selassie I, the first it says it says right here emperor hel selassie I was seized and imprisoned by the dirt and was suffocated to death by his captors on august 27 1975 1975 see now this is a major problem and i and when we're looking at the royal family let's see All right, so here we can see, if we look at, you know, even putting this, I even like typing the funeral part because it's such a, it's such a scam. It's, it's a major travesty. It's an abomination to even, uh, it's, it's, it's disappointing, you know. I, that's really all I can say is, you know, the whole funeral, because, you know, even when you're looking at the whole, as far as them even coming on the same page on the way in which he, his Imperial Majesty, the way in which they say supposedly the Emperor passed away, it's not even in agreement. Because as it says right here in one of them, and this is AP News, it says officially the death at age 83 was due to complications from a prostate condition. So here we have a major issue. We have the Crown Council saying he died through suffocation. Some people saying he died through prostate there were other claims of different other ways the supposed death of the emperor happened. When you look at this, you see the descendants of the emperor on the steps of the Trinity Cathedral. I mean, this is a major problem. It's a big problem. This is why it says in Zechariah, in Zechariah 12, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourning for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The piercing means betrayal. The people, the house, members, not all members of the house, but you have members of the royal family that, betroy, that betrayed his imperial majesty, turned their back on him. There was no body that belonged to his imperial majesty that was in that coffin. It was to try and shut down the movement. To shut down the Rastafarian movement. To say, well, look, you see, he's just a man. He's dead. He's gone. That's it. But guess what? Rastafari, the imperial Rastafarian movement still moving ahead strong. But yet, like it says, 
It's not only just them, it's also the church too has to go through a period of mourning. Because what issues have they been making? Where What are their grievances? Well, just to highlight some, let's look at some things that, and this is not really, I guess, too much to highlight the grievances, because like I said, at the end of the day, these things are going to come when it comes to all of us coming down, at sitting down at the table representatives and having these discussions because like it says it needs to happen it even talks about it in verse 7 but if we're looking at the way the church should be and we know obviously it's not all peaches and cream because if not if, if that was the case then the the judgment wouldn't come upon the house of Yah if it was already perfect but the reason why we're not really seeing Babylon utterly destroyed like it needs to be is because at the end of the day, some of us are still behaving just like Babylon. So why is the, why would the judgment go straight to Babylon and we're still committing our wickedness? It's because of our wickedness that we ended up in this situation and Babylon is so high up to where it is right now. So what, we're going to go back in 400 years from now, end up in the same scenario? No, this has to be, Babylon will be utterly destroyed. So it's important that we are utterly purged of it, cleansing ourselves so the house of judgment so the judgment can pass from us and go completely on Babylon for it to be destroyed. So let's take a look at some verses that are important to highlight of what needs to be done. So we see in Luke four, four chapter so we see in Luke chapter four eighteen through verse nineteen. It says, the spirit of Yah is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Yah. Now, we have to really look and analyze these things. Have we been accomplishing all of these things? Like, actually applying them, you know, into reality. Not only just preaching it and telling everybody else what they should do, so the church is supposed to be the safe haven. It's our refuge. So at what point does the church start to carry out these and make these things more than just ideals, but actually manifest them? When we look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 35 through 40, For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Adon, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So a lot of people will try and transfer and, and, and try to find another meaning for it. Well, you know, we're giving them and we're preaching the word. But no, it's also talking about the physical. The spiritual and the physical are hand in hand. How can a person really understand the word if he's hungry? And you got to charge him $40 or $30 or $20 a plate. How can he really concentrate if he's so worried about how everybody in the church is staring at him because he can't afford clothing? Or he can't afford, afford bus fare to arrive at the church? Or he's sick and he can't come, but nobody is showing him that love and support. All of these things have to be, the church has to embody. And it's important that also the church through the IEWF builds institutions because why are we sending our people to, we should, need, we should have our own hospitals. We should have our own supermarket. We should have the church through the IEWF can form institutions. But like I said, it's important that all of these things have to take place. When we look at John fourteen six, it says, Yeshua saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, if we are taking the Father, but we neglect the Son, 
Yeshua, who is the archetype of the new creation, the new Adam, then how can we talk about want loving our father, but yet we neglect his son? It's through what the son, the redeemer, Yeshua did that we are able to say, Abba, Father. That we are given the face of his imperial majesty, Hesalassia the first, because Yeshua made a way in the wilderness. He made rivers in the desert. After Yeshua's advent, then comes the advent of the father through his imperial majesty. It's a balance. As above, so below. So how are we able to preach his imperial majesty, but we're not preaching about the lamb? And we know these things, These we know that the father and the son come together as Elohim and lamb, because it's even mentioned, like what I just talked about, in Revelations 21, where it says, And I saw no temple therein, for Yah, Elohim Almighty, and the lamb, are the temple of it. So we're completely neglecting the aspect of the Christ consciousness, which is needed because his imperial majesty takes the Christ consciousness to the Elohim head, also known as the Godhead, by sitting on David's throne. So, you know, when we see that, and then obviously, you know, all these things happen for a reason. As it even says in John 17, 1 through 3, These words spake Yeshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Elohim, and Yeshua the Christ whom thou hast sent. So all of these things are interconnected. We cannot just take the Father and neglect the Son. Just like we cannot take the Son and then neglect the Father. It, it's, not, it's never going to work. You need His Imperial Majesty, as it talks about, comes after the advent of the Son. So before you get into that, so we see also when we look at John 6, 44, it says, No man can come unto me. And this is Yeshua speaking, except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we see when the Son comes, he glorifies the Father. Just like when the Father comes, his imperial majesty, he glorifies the Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. Just like his imperial majesty is the Messiah as the Father, through the Father, the glory of the Father, Yeshua the Christ is the Messiah through as the glory, as the glory of the Son. But when we're neglecting that dynamic, this is where it's talking about how we see in Zechariah 12. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Why? You got, you got people neglecting the father, and you have people neglecting the son. At the end, his Imperial Majesty and Yeshua HaMashiach, the Christ, they're both connected, both being the Christ, both being the Messiah. And the, the Lamb, the Christ consciousness, being in His Imperial Majesty. So it's important that both sides go through this period of cleansing and of mourning and seeing the error of their ways and repenting and turning to the Most High. Then will we all be able to sit down and actually start moving on in one accord? Because as it says, where two or three be gathered together, the most high is in the midst. So we see you have four pillars. The IEWF and the Church of Helsinki the first are connected. And you have the Crown Council of Ethiopia, which is also connected with the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation and the Crown Counts and the Church of Hell Selassie the first. And this is talked about in the Royal Charter, because as it says, the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, created by His Imperial Majesty Emperor Hell Selassie I the first and governed by Crown Prince His Imperial Highness Murd Asmach Asfawosin Hell Selassie and apparent heir His Imperial Highness Prince Zariyakab Asfawosin Hell Selassie. And we see that, you know, the signatures are attached to the incorporation documents of the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation. So we see the three are connected. I mean, come on, that's just, 
It's just obvious. You just look it up. It's all, all, all the documentation is there. And then, obviously, we have the Church of Hail Selassie, also known as Babeta Christian Hail Selassie, I the first. So we see that, you know, the church and the and the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation, as it says right here, the Church of Hail Selassie, I the first, they're connected. But they really, it's time for them to go through that period of mourning of reconciliation to the Most High. And then, you know, the four pillars, the IEWF, the Crown Council of Ethiopia, the Church of Helsalasia the First, the IEWF, Imperial Ethiopian World Federation, and the Tents of Judah can all come together at the table and start moving forward. So all of this has to happen. But like I said, you know, there are some people that are working adamantly against it. They'll bring up different things and mistakes or, you know, things that, you know, they'll use to try and cause a rift with the Crown Council or with the Church of Hell Selassie the First. And as we can see, according to prophecy, it's telling you that obviously there are things that are not completely right going on. But the Mosai is saying that the fact that it tells you, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of, Jeru of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, is the mercy aspect of the Mosai. That he wants them to do right. He wants them to do better. And that they are going to do right. Because as it says, the word of God does not return, will not return, the, the word of the Mosai will not return unto him void. It's going to accomplish everything that he, he set it out to accomplish. So when he's giving them the spirit of grace and of supplications, they're going to realize the error of their ways. This is why I say they're part of the four pillars. Because it's the only way for us to move forward. The fact that the Most High is giving them a second chance, an opportunity, shows this. If not, he would just, you know, it, it would just talk about how the house of David would be destroyed, you know, forgotten, left alone. The inhabitants of Jerusalem would be destroyed, left alone. And we would pursue other avenues of moving forward with the aim of the restoration of the kingdom. But it's telling you here, their names are mentioned. It's talked about grace, and we know, obviously, people should know now, by you know, what grace is and what mercy is, and supplications, prayers are. So it's, it's clearly telling you that this is their revival period. So for the people that criticize, you know, the House of David or would say this and that, you know, we can't trust this because it had Asphalt Wilson on it, you know, we really have to look at the story of Peter. Because people may bring up, you know, the mistakes of the past of what person may have committed, you know, whether he was responsible for the, the, the unsuccessful coup or not. At the end of the day, if we look at the scriptures, if we look at Matthew 26, 69 through 75, because the story of Oswald Wilson is, is really deep. It says, at the age of 56 in late 1972, after his father, Emperor Helsalasia I blamed him for hiding the realities of the famine in the region, which he presided over as Duke. Crown Prince Aswa Wilson suffered a massive stroke and was evacuated for a medical treatment to London and in Switzerland. And it says, the stroke left him permanently paralyzed on one side and unable to walk, and also affected his speech. Now, this is very interesting because... You know, when you look at the story of of Peter, as we read, it says in Matthew 26, because, like I said, it's, it's about the Most High is, is his mercy endureth forever, it says in the scriptures. And a lot of us always want to put in the retribution and the vengeance like it's our duty to meet those things out and to dish them out. When at the end of the day, it's the Most High. The Most High will punish you. And then cause you to realize the error of your ways and have mercy on you when you realize that what you did was wrong and you and you repent earnestly, truly within your heart. When we look at this, look at what happened with Peter, as it talks about Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 75, it says, now Peter sat without in the palace. And this is after Christ was delivered up to be crucified. Now, Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him, saying, thou also was with Yeshua of Galilee, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them, 
that was there. This fellow was also with Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Yeshua, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So we see here Peter, you know, being afraid or, or, and, or, or and for whatever other reasons, denied Christ because he knew likely that he would end up possibly being crucified or, you know, killed as a result of working with Yeshua. And we see right here, Yeshua says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So we see Peter at that time, he was afraid. He, you know, he denied Christ because he didn't want to be delivered up. And, you know, as a result, you know, he he made his mistakes. He he had he was he made he did sin. And this wasn't the only time because we also see it again when later on when he's on the ship and Yeshua sees him and he puts on a garment, something along those lines, and then he jumps into the water. Why would he jump into the water if he knew if everything was peaches and cream? If everything if he was on the right track, why would he be afraid of being seen by Yeshua? But instead he jumps into the water. So we know Peter had his mistakes, had his shortcomings. You could find that in John 21, 7, where it says, Therefore that disciple whom Yeshua loved saith unto Peter, It is Adon. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was Adon, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So, you know, you can obviously read more about it. And again, this is also symbolic, you know, of like duties and, you know, responsibilities that the disciples had and, you know, not being one to procrastinate or, you know, shirk your responsibilities, thinking that, you know, the master is gone and then now he appears and he's looking for the talents. Like when Christ gave that parable of, you know, the master that gave different people talents and came back to see what they had done with them, you know, not shirking that responsibility, but, but working, continue working because the master is going to eventually come and return as we saw like with this verse. But, you know, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I try to, like I said, you know, whenever I'm explaining things, take notes, do research, you know, and, and look at it. Because as it says in the scriptures that, you know, study to show thyself approved. So we all have to put in that work. But when we look at what it talks about in John chapter 21, verse 15 through 19, it's about forgiveness. We see it says, So when they had dined, Yeshua saith to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yeah, Adon, thou knowest that I love thee. As I said, you know, Adon, you know, Lord also in Hebrew can mean Adon, you know, which is in Hebrew like Lord and Master. So, yeah, Adon, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yeah, Adon, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Adon, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify the Most High. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So we see ultimately, you know, despite the shortcomings of Peter, he eventually got to the right track because we know that, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, the, the, the most, the mercy, the, that the most high's mercy endureth forever. So 
you know, as long as you do not commit the blasphemy that won't be forgiven, you do have, while you are on this earth, a chance at redemption. You know, if anything, we could see that, you know, at the most high, you know, you know, having Yeshua be the ultimate sacrifice to cleanse and give us a pure consciousness. So we can see that this mercy is throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament. But as I said, it's to correlate this because as we can see, you know, a person who had his shortcomings through Oswald Wilson, who, you know, in the end, what does he say? Well, I'm going to talk about a video um, that discusses what Oswald Wilson done. And as I talk through the royal letters, we see that he incorporates the IEWF. And that was something, uh, a very big accomplishment. Because he saw that the track that the EWF was moving in was not the right path. And he cared and he understood about the plight and the movement of the Rastafari movement and the goal to restore the constitutional monarchy, the monarchy of his father. So he does get forgiveness and that ultimately that that path, that 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 aspect of forgiveness, the the aspect, the aspect of trying to redeem yourself, to, to try to be to prove yourself worthy, to, to do the right thing and to get on the right path. We can see aspects of that. Just how we see it throughout Peter's journey and we see it throughout As for Wilson's journey. Even the part where he talks about how, you know, there's going to come a time when he will not be able to walk. Obviously, these things is, is, a, is symbolic, you know, but we see that even, you know, how later on in his life, As for Wilson couldn't walk anymore after his stroke. So there's a lot of parallels and we have to be able to see the correlations to it. And this and how, you know, later on in his life, how he was moving on in the right track, as we can see, he puts his signature towards the incorporation of the IEWF. And then as I'm going to show in this speech, what he says regarding the Rastafari movement. But yeah, so to go back to this, um, so to go back to the video, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, one time. The visiting March. Oh, and to put this into perspective, so this is, um, you know, the Abuna, the, the prior Abuna, the current Abuna of the Church of El Salasia the first, and the Abuna is basically like the primary head of the church, you know, the, the leader. It was previously Abuna Sinto Fox, and now it's his son that's running the Church of El Salasia the first, which is the Abuna Leo Fox. And I talked, discussed him, and discussed about him in one of my prior videos. But let's, if we take a look at this video, it's the Abuna on his radio show that I believe was in Jamaica. He talks about the correspondence he had with Amha Selassie. The name of Emperor Ejlasa I, Ethiopia, Rwanda. The visiting march of Prince David Mokana, grandson of the Emperor of Ethiopia. And this interview on JBC Radio also is official discussion with the International President of the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated has causes a lot of controversy. Most of all, the establishment of a second organization, which is seen as undermining the IEWF Incorporated, the mandatory organism of the whole movement in Jamaica. This behavior at a time when Rasta should be thinking of consolidating their efforts, dealing with a free Ethiopia, and not dividing the movement by the personality behavior of Element, who has motivated the Prince to oppose the platform, to oppose the platform established by the Emperor Hades last night, the first of Ethiopia, 1937. The meeting held with the different house of Rasta and the reactionary statement made by some of the supporters of the Prince created a situation wherein the international president had to visit London to report the whole development to the Crown Prince of Ethiopia, Prince Asowasan Ayel Selassie, and the Crown Council. This was done in June. During the president's visit to the Crown Prince, a letter was given to him to be published in the Daily Cleaner in Jamaica, and a tape message 
from the Crown Prince was given to him to be broadcast to the members of the Rastafarian movement and Federation members. This broadcast to oppose the platform given to him to be broadcast to the members of the Rastafarian movement and Federation members. This broadcast you are about to hear is from the Crown Prince of Ethiopia, Prince Asawasan Ed Selassie. IEWF Incorporated hope this broadcast will enlighten the brethren and citizen of what is their responsibility and priorities and the organization they should rally their support dealing with restoration and liberation leading to repatriation to Ethiopia is last said first liberator. Brother Manuel Fox, this is the uh, recording of the uh, letter that Sinclair Highness uh, Crown Prince has uh, given to him to be broadcast. Highness uh, Crown Prince has uh, kindly given to you and as Secretary to the Council, the Crown Council, I am pleased to read it out and record it for you to be uh, read and understood by the followers of the last time who especially the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated members. The letter is dated June the 12th, 1987, London. To the International President and the Council of the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated and all Rastafarians and followers of the movement around the world. Greetings in the name of the Almighty God and may his blessings reach you all, I and I, whatever you are. I must, uh, Crown Prince. And may his blessings reach you all, I and I, whatever you are. We are thankful for the excellent situation report made in our presence here in London on June the 9th, 1987, by Brother Emmanuel Fox, the International President of the IEWF Incorporated. In true faith, and unwavering allegiance to the sacred objectives of my father, Emperor Alice Lassie I, the first, I call upon the loyal followers of all the Rastafari movement at large, and the IEWF Incorporated in particular, again, to redouble your continued efforts in the ongoing struggles, using all democratic wisdoms, might and strength to unify and solidify the black peoples of the world in the defense of the legitimate sovereignty of our country and the free people of Ethiopia everywhere. And may his blessings reach you all, I and I, of our country and the free people of Ethiopia everywhere, against the oppressive evils of the Marxist military junta dictatorship under the direction and domination of Ethiopia by the communist bloc countries, particularly that of Soviet Russia. It is necessary also at this stage to restate the true wishes and sacred call of my father, Emperor Haile Selassie I, as made in 1937, for the black peoples of the world to unite first in the defense of Ethiopia's sovereignty and second, the restoration of the constitutional monarchy of the House of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba dynasty in Ethiopia and finally, to promote and legitimize the right of repatriation of all black people to the motherland. This sacred call is very of our country and the free people of it. Repatriation of all black people to the motherland. This sacred call is very much valid and alive more than ever today. To these ends, His Majesty my father has then set up the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated whose charter we have already renewed and mandated and the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated to stop the abuse of the sacred organization by pro-communist camps that have attempted to control the work of the international body without any stated allegiance to us, the Crown Prince, the only legitimate custodian of the constitutional monarchy of Solomon and Queen Sheba dynasty of Ethiopia, which is that 
of my father, Emperor Haile Selassie I the first. It is therefore essential and should be known publicly that the IEWF Incorporated is charged for the repatriation of all black people to the more essential and should be known publicly that the IEWF Incorporated is charged to organize, protect, and manifest the sacred goals and objectives and truly represent the Rasta movement at large democratically and politically and embrace the grassroots members of the movement at their own parishes by seeking representations from their own organizational bodies. Unity in diversity shall be the democratic call of the might and strength of the Rasta movement at large, loyal to its cause and the imperial house. We therefore ask you all Rastas again to unify and solidify your efforts at the top by being represented in the council of the IEWF Incorporated under the umbrella of the renewed charter. The IEWF Incorporated shall to this end broaden its appeal and representation by calling a congress for essential and should be known publicly. The IEWF Incorporated shall to this end broaden its appeal and representation by calling a congress of all the Rastas movement to give it legitimacy and continuity of purpose and achievement. Finally, we are pleased to note the program to establish worldwide chapters and the provisions planned for the headquarters to be built in Jamaica. We also note with appreciation all the detailed activities as reported to us personally. It suffices therefore to say that any other person, prince or no prince, or representative of any organization claiming to represent the imperial house and attempting to deflect the loyalty and purpose of the work of the Rasta movement in our name is to be ignored and treated with contempt. We are not a party to, nor know of any such body or person seeking your cooperation in the name of our imperial house. The true and direct expression of the Incorporated shall to this end in the name of our imperial house. The true and direct expression of our wishes and message is to be sought from us directly working under our own council. The imperial house is a bad politics and does not have any party allegiance to no one except to the sacred call of my father, Emperor Haile Selassie I, the first, for the black people of the world to unite again in the defense of the Ethiopian sovereignty, in the restoration of the constitutional monarchy of the house of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba dynasty in Ethiopia, and the right of the repatriation of all the black people of Africa to the motherland. These are our lofty causes, and we call upon all Rastas to rise up to your sacred call of duty. This I am saying to you, my people, the blessings of the might of the Trinity be with you all. Liberty in our nation is Imperial Highness Mary. in the name of our Imperial House. So as we can see, though, as we can see in this video, it touched upon a lot of different things. And I could probably also do a video, you know, just highlighting, you know, a PowerPoint of like the different topics. But, you know, some things that come to mind is the part about being the crown council being the legitimate custodian of the ethiopian empire of the constitutional monarchy so as we see you know when i talked about you know on the the site suggesting that that is no longer the primary goal that is not the intent that's not the imperial dignity the imperial dignity is that the constitutional monarchy continues that as even as for Wilson Hel Selassie said in the video it's an Ill illegitimate government that was installed in Ethiopia so when do we wipe our hands and dust our feet off with that and let an injustice continue to fester do we not know like you just said that that is the imperial Solomonic dynasty the house of David which the Most High has ordained of all the other kingdoms, he set up one to rule that he chose, as it says, where he put his name at, because he established her himself. So now, when do we wipe our hands off with that and just turn our backs to it and just feel like now we should just let this just be a cultural heritage and forget the intent of reestablishing the constitutional monarchy? So, 
we see that that is instilled in this video. We also see it's instilled about the three objectives of sovereignty, which I talked about. We all are pushing for sovereignty of the restoration of the constitutional monarchy and of repatriation. As I said, that repatriation being the third part and how after the war, we're going to see a second wave of an exodus that is talked about, is prophesied, that is going to happen of people coming in to the land of Africa. You know, and obviously, you know, there are going to be some people that are still going to be remaining in the different lands because there's going to be a big period of rebuilding because all of these empires are going to be crushed. So, you know, us setting up, you know, being placed in charge of leadership of all the nations of the world, obviously, we're still going to be, you know, you're going to have people, um, Israelites in other areas of the world, but there's also still going to be a repatriation of people that want to come back to Africa. So we see all of this discussed. Another part we see discussed is the IEWF being the banner by which all black people come under the, its umbrella. And also about setting up chapters of the IEWF globally. We also see discussed regarding how Rastafarians, different camps need to see send representatives by which we can start the process of centralizing under the banner of the IEWF. Because as you know, there's still a lot of Rastafarian camps that still have in their mindset that they're going to continue under the EWF. And as he said, the EWF was renewed under the IEWF because there's a lot of agents that have infiltrated into the EWF. So it's time we go under the renewed banner of the IEWF. And any other, any prince that's not working for that aim, then that means that they are not aligned with the will of the father. Because when we see what Amha Selassie is speaking, he's speaking through the spirit. He's talking about unity. The same thing that His Imperial Majesty said to Rastafarians that they must centralize and organize. He's saying that same thing. So when I talked about with Peter, you know, how, you know, he may have had his shortcomings, but in the end, we know that he eventually was able to find grace and mercy. We see the same with Amha. We talk about his past, but we're not talking about his later work, what he did afterwards after realizing his shortcomings, after repenting and praying. This same period of repenting and prayer also is going to come upon the house, the crown council of Ethiopia, the house of David. It's going to come upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as I said, the inhabitants, the temple within Jerusalem, which is the church of Hel Selassie the I. It has to come. It will. And it's necessary. As it talked about, the IEWF is the primary umbrella by which all Rastafarians can come under. As we know, the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation is connected with the Church of Hel Selassie I the First. So all Rastafarians becoming Imperial Rastafarians under the banner of the Church. So we see the banner of the Church, we see the banner of the IEWF, Imperial Ethiopian World Federation, we see the banner of the Crown Council of Ethiopia. So it's important that we come together because it's like if we having, um, if we're sending del, if like it's important that and it's great we see that Prince Jeremiah is is visiting different camps because he's establishing relations with them that they see that he's doing the works and that they they will they they are going to follow him and it's important that he is directing them to the IEWF to the Church of Hell Selassie the first. Because by coming, by as as Asfal was saying, sending those representatives so that the church can have deliberation and discussions with them, so that they can all come under the umbrella. This is how we move as one. Instead of having, we don't need to have all these other camps like all these other groups have. Like you have evangelical, Pentecostal, Baptist, and not Rastafari doesn't need that. We need to be operating as one entity one unit 
And this is where this comes back to the petition. Let the Ethiopian crown begin to serve its people again. The line of Judah hath prevailed. You know, the link is up here. If it doesn't appear up here, then you can go to the description below. Go to the link, sign the petition. I'm going to be using this petition in every video because it's very important because it talks about once the petition, once this reaches a thousand signatures, it reaches before the president of the crown council, the prince, a descendant of Hail Selassie the first, Prince Aramias Sali Selassie Hail Selassie. Friend, for the Crown Council of Ethiopia to be the voice, the unifying voice of Israelites, of Rastafarians globally. And I say Israelites because, you know, not all Israelites have come to the complete knowledge of Rastafari. But it's important that they get to, to that they come to that point to realize, you know, in order for us to move forward, as it says, we need to have sovereignty. We have that through the imperial Solomonic dynasty, also known as the House of David. The House of David is the Crown Council of Ethiopia. And we know too when we when you really look deep enough, Rastafari, you know, we can see that or 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 translated literation or translation of it as through Rosh Tiferet. And that you can find esoterically in the scriptures. And I'm just gonna touch on that before I end the video, just to bring it all home. So we see if we go to one Chronicles chapter twenty nine. If we look at, if we scroll down, go to the 11th verse, where it says, where it mentions the head. So we see here, it says, Rosh for head. If we go to where it says, Glorious, it says, Tefara. You know, and some people say Tiferet or Rosh Tiferet. But if we look at that and we compare it to Ras. Farai, we can see the name, it's a very similar relation to it, Tafari, and we see here, Tifara, and we see here it says, the meaning, glory, so head and glory are encompassed within Ras Tafari and Tafari or Tifer Tiferi is the name of Tafari Makonan who during his coronation becomes Hail Selassie the first but as we can see if we scroll down or scroll up actually known as a child as Lij Tafari Makonan so Ras Tafari as we see you know that that would later be one of his titles Ras we see that this name Rastafari through Rosh Tifara. So it's right there in the scriptures. It's all there connected. And if we go into Psalms, we go into the Strongs and we look at the meaning of where it says. A psalm or song for the sons of Korah. His foundation is in the holy mountains. Yah loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of the O city of Elohim, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. Now, when you start looking at, you know, Rahab is also another word for Egypt. As we see, you know, if we scroll down, let's see an epithet of Egypt. And then we see, if we, let's go back. We see Rahab and Babylon. Now with the blue letters, it can make it kind of hard to see. So actually let me open this up in another tab so that it could be a little bit easier. I'll just use that to find the Hebrew meanings of it. But if we look at this, you know, 
his foundation is in the holy mounds. And then when it talks about, I'll make mention of Rahab and Babylon, we see that the Israelites were in captivity in Rahab and Babylon. When you look at Philistia and Tyre, these were areas that were near Israel. Now, Ethiopia, as I said, Israel was located north of Ethiopia. So we see these surrounding areas that surround Israel. And then we see through Ethiopia, it says this man was born there. So when you look at it, some people may be like, well, no, nah, it could possibly be another place. But it's telling you with Ethiopia, this man was born there. Why? Because these are all the encompassing areas of Israel. And then you have Ethiopia, who would later become assimilate these areas as it grew into an empire through the different time periods where its boundaries expanded. And obviously it says, and of Zion, it shall be said this, and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. So now we see that Zion, as I said, synonymous with the Ark of the Covenant, being in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is Zion. Now, if we take a look, you know, how the Israelites went through the captivities in Egypt, in Babylon. And then later, as I said before, when we look at, you know, um, the part where it says in Psalms 68, verse 31, that princes shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto Yah, that the Israelites are returning into Ethiopia, the land. It's all connected, and it's telling you that it's a man, a person, is going to be born there. Who? As it says, Yah loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. So it's telling you, when it talks about Isaiah 11, how the spirit of Yah shall rest upon him, it's this man right here that is born in Ethiopia. Now, to give you another, another clue, and this is huge, when we look at the meaning of mountains, its foundation is in the holy mountains. What does it say? Harar. It uses Harar. And there's also other transliterations of it, like we see Harari. Now, if we look at, you know, Harar, Harari, the region that his that Tafar Makunin is born in is Ejersagoro. Which is, if we look at Ejersagoro, uh, let's see. So if we look at Tafar Makonan, it says he's born July 23rd, 1892, in the village of Ijersa Goro in the Horar province of Ethiopia. It tells you Horar. Some people would be like, well, nah, it's not technically fully in Horar. It's like uh, technically in the Horar Gi province. But as we see right here, even in the meaning of the word, the transliteration, we see Horar Ri, you know. So it's like it's telling you the Harar, this is where he's located in this vicinity, in this region. And we see that through the Harar Gi or Harari, through, you know, being in the Harar province. I mean, it's all there, but it's like we keep trying to move, you know, the goalposts. Every time we are right there, someone wants to move the goalposts to something else. And just even to use another one to connect it and bring it further home. If we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 10, it says, And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that Yah had shewed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel his people. And here we see, a descendant of Solomon, a descendant of David. We just got talk, done talking about the House of David, the Imperial Ethiopian Solomonic Dynasty being the House of David, Crown Council of Ethiopia being the House of David, of His Imperial Majesty by sitting on the throne of David being the King of Israel. How it says, princes shall come out of Egypt, which as I discussed, the princes represent Israel, the Israelites, coming out of the land of bondage, coming into Ethiopia. So we see everything correlate as it says in the and it says princes come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto the most high. So we see the correlation throughout the scriptures. And then when you see the seventh month and twenty-third day, I mean it even says right here, July twenty-third, the seventh month, twenty and three day, twenty-third day. Right there. It's right there. And then some people will be like, well, no, you got to look at the Ethiopian calendar. Then it doesn't fall on that month. Well, even if you look at the Ethiopian calendar, he falls in, let's say, the month. Um, it will likely be 
the monk, the during the age of Aquarius, and I don't use zodiacs like that, but you know, obviously we know that these things are sometimes used as signs, such as when the three magi were able to find out about the birth of Yeshua because they said that his star was in the sky. So I'm not saying to, you know, that we need to do practice astrology and everything like that, but I'm just saying it is a miraculous birth surrounding Tafari Makonan in that the the sign, not the month I mean, but the sign would be, if you're going through the Ethiopian calendar, it will be Aquarius because the Ethiopian calendar is different than the Zodiac, or I mean the Gregorian calendar. And when you study about the Aquarius, because a lot of these things they took from the Hebrew Israelites, it's the revealing of knowledge. So the awakening of the people. We see that through the birth of Tafari and Makonan and him growing up and ascending through the ranks to become emperor of Ethiopia, taking the Christ consciousness to the Elio the, to the Elohim head or the Godhead as it talks about in Acts 2.29-30. to It says right here, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that Yah has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. This being the throne of David. Who accomplishes this? His imperial majesty, Hail Selassie I the first. So it's all connected, whether you're looking at it through Harar, the foundation, his holy foundation of his elect, who the spirit, who the Most High puts his spirit upon, as it says in Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of Yah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yah. So, so we see that the spirit of the Most High is going to rest upon his elect. Why? Because it says right here that a rod shall come from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. We see that because his imperial majesty was not the direct son of Menelik II, but his father was a relative, a cousin of Menelik. So they descend through the line of Solomon through Sali Selassie. They are descendants of David, but they weren't a direct son. So this is why they goes back to the stem of Jesse, Jesse being the father. Or the father's father in that you had David and then you had his father being Jesse. So he wasn't a direct descendant of Menelik, the man, the David, but he was a descendant through further back in the genealogy. And this is why it says, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Because someone not directly from the line of Menelik II, but a branch. So we see all the prophecies being connected through his imperial majesty, whether it's the date, whether it's the where he's born, you know, it, whether it's the, the, the circumstances by which he ascends to the throne. It's all there in the scriptures. So this is why I said, even when I talked about the meaning of the word Rosh Tiferah or Ras Tiferah, we see the glory. You know, why? Because at the end of the day, we see Psalms 24, chapter 24, verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek them, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Why? Because it's not saying, O oh, Israel, because Israel is the spiritual side, the physical nature of man. We seek, sought the face, the physical representative, the highest representative of the Most High on earth. So can we not say His Imperial Majesty? Is the Most High God? Why not? So we see in John 10, 34, it says, Yeshua answered them, Is it not written in your law, I say, ye are gods? 
So if we know that, you know, within all of us, the lowest of low of men, that is the potential to become God. That you can become an Elohim. And obviously we know, you know, some people be like, yes, you know, well, it's lowercase. Yes, but at the end of the day, it says Elohim. That we have the potential to be God. To be Elohim. Which is a plural word. Then how, then how can we reference the one who sits on the throne of David, who, as it says, then Solomon sat on the throne of Yah. As it says right here, Yah. Because as I said, Lord, you know, that's the transliteration of the word Yah. The Most High. As king, instead of David his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. So once David, you know, moved on, and was, you know, went to his eternal rest, we see Solomon taking over as king. By sitting, by being of David's line, sitting upon the throne, he's sitting on the throne of Yah. So who can you consider to be higher or greater than Solomon at that moment? There can be no other higher representative that you can have besides the one who sits on the throne of Yah. So his imperial majesty, as we see, being of the imperial Solomonic dynasty, being a descendant of David, being of the line of David, sitting on David's throne, as it talks about in Acts 2.29, that the Christ will sit on the, th the throne of David. We know this for a fact. It's, again, for people that say, you know, oh, well, it doesn't actually say throne of David. But when you look at it, I mean, that's why I said it's important to read between the lines. Because if we take this Acts 2.29, is speaking about David. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulchre, is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that Yah has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So, where is this throne? This throne of David, the throne of, of Yah, is on earth. Yes, as above, so below. So yes, there's a throne in heaven. But we're talking to the throne on earth, as it talked about before when we read where it talks about this is a generation that seeketh thy face. This is a physical manifestation of the kingly character of Christ. The Christ consciousness sitting upon the David's sitting upon David's throne, sitting on the throne of Yah. This is happening on earth. Just as it happens in heaven, it also has to happen on earth. Because as we know, I talked about in my previous videos regarding this. Now, when we look at this, we can also go to Isaiah 9-7. It says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yah of hosts will perform this. Upon the throne of David. Government and peace. So we see this accomplished through his imperial majesty. As even when we open up this full chapter. When it says. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called wonderful counselor. The mighty Elohim. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. Who do we see this through? We don't see it through Yeshua Mashiach because as I talked about in my other videos, he was not running the country of Israel. And there like he verily he didn't often enter into Jerusalem unless it was like a holy a holy day or a holy feast occasion he would enter into Jerusalem. Yet we see with King Solomon he was reigning through Jerusalem. So how can we say that Christ sits upon the throne? And the during the advent of Yeshua. It's not until the advent of the Father that we see this accomplished. Because as it says, the Most High shall establish him himself. So when I say the Most High God, we see how it says, ye are all gods. And we see Solomon sitting on the throne of Yah. So his imperial majesty, as it says, ye are all gods or ye are all Elohim. Having the Christ consciousness, being an Elohim, sitting on the throne of Yah. He is the highest representative. So he is the Most High God on earth. The highest representative of Yah on earth is his imperial majesty. So there's no blasphemy when it when when I'm saying that. 
obviously we know there's a most high creator who created everything who's above everyone but what i'm saying is we see right here that it's talking about flesh and blood when from the very beginning of verse six where it says for unto us a child is born the moment you're talking about birth out of a womb that's flesh and blood right there so instead of us making it so like a distant concept that's so hard to like i, I can't understand it we should be able to understand it through yeshua we see the miraculous birth we see you know the miracles we see the divinity in the flesh so how are we not able to now see it when the coming of his imperial majesty this is why the son came in his archetype and then following we see the arrival of the father so it shouldn't be a confusion no more regarding this how does this work and that I, I don't get out no it shouldn't be no more confusion it lays it out plainly and there's more verses that I can actually get into, but, you know, I wanted to just wrap it with this. Um, so, yeah. Like I said, you know, we had the four pillars coming together. And it's going to be key to us uniting with the government, the people uniting with the government, it being the unifying voice, and then obviously returning to the land we see how, you know, the Crown Council and the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation, the church, needs to go through its period of mourning and cleansing. Or, well, actually, we see how the Crown Council of Ethiopia and the church need to go through its period of cleansing. And in the meantime, it doesn't say, well, you know, while that's happening, the Tents of Judah need to just be patient and just wait. No, because it tells you in the seventh verse that the that the Most High shall save the tents of Judah first. Save, what is that? Save, edit that. Save, what is that? That is an action. It's a verb. It's a, it's a doing something. It's the Most High, when it says the word, uh, let's see. We see here in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Judah is going to be making moves. They're going to be making things happen. That is going to catch everybody's attention. Light a fire to cause them to start acting. And we see this because he even talks about here in Zechariah 12, where it talks about the governors of Judah. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about, and on the right hand and on the left, and, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. So we have to light that fire. The tents of Judah have to do it. And then we're going to then we're going to see the glory of the house of David. Then we will see the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But we just cannot wait because some people are saying they want to see restoration before repatriation. But as we see throughout countless verses, the verses are telling us, come out of her, my people. Obviously, like I said, only a remnant is going to come. But we have to start creating that change that we want to be that we want to be a part of. The tents of Judah, that's why it says the, the Most High will save the tents of Judah first. Then following, we see now the glory. Then after that, we see the glory of the house of David. Then we can see the church, the glory of the church of his imperial majesty, Heselassia I, the inhabitants of, of Jerusalem. So, as I said, I always keep my information, you know, you can see it up top. You know, if you have, if you're like minded and you want to work together, feel free to give me a call. And, you know, like I said, now is the time for us to start working.